Thank you very much, church. Thank you, everyone. And it is wonderful to be preaching the word to you this morning and just uh, talking about God's goodness and talking about standing against the flow. Sounds a very serious, heavy subject, doesn't it? And uh, as I was preparing, it took me back to my childhood when I was a young fella. And uh, my mum, who, who was born in Wyala, loved the state of South Australia, uh, came up with the idea that for two Christmas holidays, we were going to do a tour of the York Peninsula and then the next year do a tour of the Air Peninsula. So that's what we did, stopped at different caravan parks and, I don't know, spent a couple of weeks just driving around and seeing a bit of our state. And uh, one thing that we're exposed to as kids was uh, some beaches, uh, on the, certainly on the far west coast of, of uh, Air Peninsula, that were very uh, dangerous beaches. Many of you would be aware that some of them, a lot of wave activity, there's signs up warning about swimming there. And uh, we arrived at one of these beaches once and uh, mum and dad um, said, well, okay, it's a very dangerous beach, you can just walk in, you know, just up to your knees and just stand there a bit and that'll be it, don't go for a swim, don't do anything. And I can't remember the name of the beach, but the entry to the water was like at 45 degrees. Do you know these beaches? Not like Adelaide, okay? It was a real beach. And it went like 45 degrees because the waves are churning everything out. And within a few, you know, like steps, you're over your head and, and you're gone. And you're heading out to sea. Good night. So uh, my brother and I, he, he was younger than me, we walked in and we thought we'd got up to a safe level and we just planted ourselves there. And of course, in comes you know, this, this wave and it washes against us and, you know, it goes right up back the beach and uh, then it came back the other way and my, my brother was standing next to me, his, both his feet went out from underneath him and he was, he was going, he was, on, he was on his way out and I just instinctively reacted and grabbed his arm, it was the last thing I could get hold of and held on to him and we're both looking at each other and we walked straight out, did not go back in but, but we both had this sense that, you know, he was about to not go against the flow. He was going with the flow, uh, but he needed my help to go against the flow so that uh, he survived uh, and that uh, we made it out of that beach alive. And uh, every time I think about against the flow, I think about him and I helping each other, standing firm and <laughs> trying to go against the flow. And, uh, you know, there's a lot in that for uh, our message today and for our series as we conclude. Uh, what we've been doing during this series is looking at the life of Daniel and his three friends, four young uh, Jewish men who were exiled from their homeland in about the 6th century BC and taken to the superpower of the time known as the, the Babylonian Empire. And this series is focused on their faithfulness uh, while they were even, you know, promoted and, and into the very centre of power, their faithfulness to remain true to the call that God had on their life, even in the face of many uh, difficult temptations. And as we've done that, we've been invited ourselves to reflect on our faithfulness to uh, Jesus and the new life he's given us through the death on the cross, his death on the cross. Uh, in all things, Jesus is our example and Jesus was called by his heavenly father to die on our behalf. And I just wanted to start with this today, right from the outset, before we get on with Daniel's story, uh, because I had a strong sense as I thought about that, that Jesus himself had to stand against the flow that there were many things that Jesus could have chosen to do with his earthly life. But right from the very outset, he had, a, he had a sense that God had something for him to do. And as it turned out in his situation, that was die on a cross. And the reason that he had to die on a cross is pretty simple. Because you and I have got a sin problem that we can't fix. We've got something that every single one of us who sits here today have need Jesus. We need what he has done for us. Uh, whether uh, it's our separation from God, that tendency, you know, just to do our own thing, or whether it's all the wrong things that we've done or all the wrong things that have been, been done to us. We have something that we can't solve. That's essentially the gospel, and it's essentially Jesus who 
fix that for us. And I wanted to put this scripture right up from the start. Romans 5 verse 8 that says, But God demonstrates his love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And that's where we're going to end up today. But I wanted to make sure that that's also where we started. The reason that that verse in front of you is true is because Jesus stood against the flow. Against the flow of his own preferences, against the flow of you know, what might have been easy, against the flow of the, the elites at the time who were telling him, you know, stop preaching, stop healing, you know, uh, don't help out. Then thought they were doing a good thing by killing him, and in one sense they were in that they were breaking the power of sin over our life forever when we say yes to him. So Jesus had to stand against the flow. What Daniel and his friends accomplished years earlier, hundreds of years earlier, was just a forerunner for what he did. Now, so far in Daniel's life, we've looked at uh, the following incidents, which was them standing against the flow. Uh, you remember that they decided to avoid uh, the royal food when they were living in the royal palace, probably because the meat uh, and food had been sacrificed or offered to idols. Uh, before it was served so they felt that that was something they couldn't take part in uh, might have been a good diet or recommending for a good diet but maybe it was more to do with religious practices uh, the three young men uh, refused to worship an idol of gold also during their time there and they had to survive the punishment meted out which was being thrown into a furnace uh, and Daniel also had to faithfully share a vision of the kings that predicted uh, his coming demise and then his restoration. So they all had to stand up in difficult circumstances and say, you know, this is what God wants. This is what God desires. And I reckon that's something that everyone here today is going to have to do at some stage in their life. Whether you are sitting here today, you've been a follower of Jesus for many years and you can say, well, Pastor, I can think of quite a few occasions when I've had to do that. Maybe you're sitting here and you're thinking, you know, I actually haven't done that for quite a while. And I'm going to say, why? Why has that been that way? What's that saying? If you haven't run headlong into the devil recently, you might be going in the same direction. Okay, so there's just something to think on. But, but all, of us, all of us have to come to a stage in our life and we actually have to say, when we say yes to Jesus for the first time, we've got to basically cry out and say, what has happened so far in my life? I'm now saying no to that and I'm now saying yes to Jesus. And in that sense, we have to stand against the flow, as it were, of our past life what we have lived so far, and then we've got to say yes to the flow of God in our life. So everyone's got to stand against the flow at some stage. If you want what God wants for you, then you have to stand against the flow at some stage. There's got to be a point. The Bible says, Jesus said simply, John chapter 3, you must be born again. No one can see the kingdom of heaven until they've been born again. Quote, Jesus Christ. There's got to be a change. There's got to be a turning point. There's got to be a, a before and an after. There's got to be a point where you stand up and say, Jesus, I'm following you. That was my previous life. My new life is following Jesus. And some of you might need to make that decision today. Some of you, that time has come. For many of you, it's time to make it again. It's time to say again, this is my lot in life. I've chosen Jesus. I am standing against the flow of the world and I'm flowing with the flow of the Holy Spirit. Today, we look at the final episode in Daniel's journey of standing against the flow when uh, he was literally thrown to the lions. You've heard that expression. You hear it a bit. You might have thought, didn't they, didn't they do that to the first Christians? They did. This has actually came many years before that when Daniel was thrown into the lion's den because he chose to obey God and not go with the flow that he was being pulled towards at that time. And we're going to read the story and then we're going to tap into it and see how we're going. Does that sound all right, folks? Okay, Daniel chapter 1, Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 5. 
It pleased King Darius to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom. I guess they were sort of like mayors or, or local landowners, with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So this is a bit later in Daniel's life. He's still up the top in the public service and he's going to get this job of one of three. The satraps were made accountable to them so that the king might not suffer loss. Now Daniel so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional qualities that the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Similar set up to Joseph when Pharaoh made him number two over everything apart from himself. Daniel was on the same path because of his reliability and effectiveness. At this, the administrators and the satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel in his conduct of government affairs, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. So why the others were looking for that in Daniel, I do not know. I've got a few clues. Maybe they were corrupt and negligent and Daniel showed them up. And, and they thought, mate, we've got to get rid of this guy because he's making our life difficult because he's doing so well. And that can be something that can happen to any of us when we try to live God, live life and work in God's way, that we can stand out because of these things and, and cause friction in the workplace. But we need to stand firm in that. We need to stand against the flow. But they also might have been uh, thinking, uh, we're never going to get a share of what's going on around here in terms of bribes or what's being taken because we can't sway Daniel in this matter. So they were being shown up by him and they weren't being enriched by him because he wouldn't play ball. Finally, these men said, we will never find any basis for charges against this man, Daniel, unless it has something to do with the law of his God. Maybe that could have been said in the strategy meeting of a major political party the week of the last week of the election campaign. Just saying it out there, you think about that one for a little while. Unless it has something to do with the law of his God. So they've gone straight for his faith, straight for his religion, and they're going to use that to turn it against him in order to bring him down. Is this sounding familiar to anyone? You wouldn't think it's still going today, would you? But there you go. So this is very interesting. This happened towards the end of Daniel's career in the public service. And they've decided that his commitment to the living God is one that they're going to target. And this is something that some, maybe many of you have experienced. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 19 to 21, It is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you, and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. If we can just leave that up there for a minute, you'll see that the idea of suffering for doing good is actually part of our calling when it comes to following Jesus. Now, some of you just tuned out then. You started thinking about lunch. You thought, hang on a minute, the wires are crossed. He's, he's lost it. Get him a drink of water. And the reason is because when we feel called to do things that we like to do, we're very attentive to the Holy Spirit. I hear you clearly, Jesus. You're, causing, you're calling me to the coast of Amalfi. I'm ready to go to Tuscany, the Greek islands in summer. Yes, Lord. I'm there to serve you faithfully. We, we, I heard that one very clearly. But, that, Lord, I, sorry, what? You're calling me to suffer for doing good. I, I can't hear you properly. You're breaking up. I'm, gonna, I'm tuning out. Good night. I didn't hear that call properly, Lord. But, you see, Jesus, he suffered. He suffered. And he suffered for doing good. And he suffered for us to make a real difference in our lives. And we need to understand that this life that we're called to does involve an element of suffering. And it's so hard in Australia. We're so used to life in this lucky country. 
it is a great place. And we're used to have an expectation that we can meet without, you know, opposition. And we don't expect to get, you know, harsh treatment. But the fact is, increasingly, there are opportunities when in this country we're going to have to stand up and we're going to have to suffer for doing good. We're going to have to suffer for the will of God. We're going to be at risk in our unemployment, if not in our personal security. We're going to be at risk in our popularity or our relationships because of the nature of things at the moment. And we have to be prepared for that. And we have to understand that we are following the example of Jesus and of Daniel, and that we are called to do it. Did you hear that call, church? I got it out of the Bible. So this is Daniel's reaction to this edict. What they decide to do is they talk the king, Darius, into passing an edict, which at that time for the Medes and the Persians could not be reversed. And they said, O King Darius, you are so wonderful... Why not get everyone to pray to you for 30 days? Oh, and if they don't, if they pray to someone else, throw them into the lion's den. Now, Darius, he doesn't know what they're up to. I don't know, he's not quite tuned in, but he likes the idea of people praying to him, and that's exciting. Uh, you know, uh, he, he thinks, what, the adulation, the worship, this is wonderful, I definitely deserve it. Yeah, we'll go with it. And he writes it in. So then when Daniel hears about this, we find in verse 10, he does something very interesting. And this is what it says. It says, now when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Now, this is a very interesting decision to take, and I want to talk about it for a little minute. Uh, firstly, you're thinking, okay, the window's open towards Jerusalem. What's that about? Remember, he's in exile. He's been deported as a young man, and he is away from what they called the promised land. So he, as he prays as an expression of faith or, you know, to help him visualize, to look towards the apparent home of the presence of God, the temple, he looks back towards Jerusalem. And this is something that he's always done. He does it three times a day. And of course, because he's by the window, he's at risk of being seen praying to God, not King Darius. But Daniel's decided that this is an important principle at stake. And it's an act of worship that he's involved in. And to change his act of worship, to change his act of devotion is to compromise and is in some way to give in to the direct threat that's been made to his religion. And folks, here's the thing. We need to be very sensitive to things that we regularly do and have decided to do as an act of devotion to God and understand when those things are being threatened. And at some stage, we are going to have to take a stand. We're going to have to make a decision. And we're going to have to arrive at a point where to say to change that thing is not right. Yeah, he could have hit in the toilet. Yes, he could have cut it down to once a day. I don't know. But, but he just felt a line is about to be crossed and I'm staying right here in that point. And that's not easy to know where that line is sometimes, but if you're uncertain, better draw it soon. Because in the end, you've crossed it, you've passed it, and, and you don't actually know where it is anymore. So I want to encourage you in that today. The key phrase for us here is, just as he had done before. And Nathan told about our church in Colombo that the police are saying don't meet after those terrible bombings. And they said, we meet every week as an act of worship to our God. We will do just as we had done before. They felt it wasn't the time to pack up and go home, but they needed to keep going through. God bless them. Our prayers are with them. So... I. 1 Peter 3, Peter loves to talk about this subject in his first letter. He says this, Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? What he means is, generally speaking, surely people are on the side of good. He's generally right. But even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. 
The reason for the quote marks around do not fear their threats, do not be frightened is because he is quoting the prophet Isaiah. So this is something that was retained by God's people. Do not fear their threats, do not be frightened. And sometimes we are the subject of threats, but I want to encourage you today that we're encouraged (laughs) not to be frightened in that sense. And so the administrators and the satraps, they were keeping a close eye on Daniel. Of course, they'd enacted the law so that they could trap him. And then his behaviour gets reported to the king. And this is what happens following this. Daniel chapter 6. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. And the king said to Daniel, May your God whom you serve continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of the nobles so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. And then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him and he could not sleep. Now this is a very interesting situation where the the guy that enacted the law can't change it, doesn't want Daniel to suffer because of it but can't do anything about it. But he even effectively prays for Daniel and speaks a blessing over him saying, may your God whom you serve continually rescue you. And sometimes we can be lulled into a situation where we think we're in a place and we're on our own as a Christian. We think there's no one else who who sees the way we do or or we're, we're isolated. But I want you to understand that God is able to work in and through people that don't even acknowledge him and aren't even aware of it. Do you understand this, church? So the Holy Spirit is not limited to people and places who say yes to Jesus. That the Holy Spirit is in fact witnessing, I think, always to everyone, one way or another, including through your decision to follow Jesus. Your quiet life, maybe, or your step after step of obedience is having an impact even if you don't see it. And at times in your situation, people are able to work on your behalf even if they don't acknowledge Jesus. I have a dear friend that I was a cadet with at the news newspaper. Does anyone remember that institution? That is ancient history. Do you know, folks, anyone under 40 or 30, newspapers used to be published in the afternoon? And you'd buy one on the way home from work before you got on the bus or the train. Do you, anyone remember that life? <laughs> okay, well, I worked for one of them before it went bust. None left now. And I had a friend there and we became, we've become lifelong friends. He's not a follower of Jesus. But, you know, of all the people that encouraged me in my life, he would be one of the most encouraging people of my walk with Jesus and my ministry and mission in the church. It's a true story. I invited a whole stack of people from outside this place to hear my first sermon right here in 2005 after I'd been ordained. He was the only one that showed up. And he's, he's been catching up with me. and, and inter- Very interesting. He's the most unchristian, he's the most Christian, unchristian, non-Christian you've ever seen in your life. I don't know if I got that right, but you know what I mean. You got some of those people in your life, haven't you? You got some of those people. So, so, you know, I often say to people, God owns every house, God owns every cent, God owns every job in this world, no matter who's in possession of it. Do you understand me? And every person is available for the work of God, including, it seems, King Darius on this occasion. You know, Daniel doesn't say anything in this particular passage at this time, but I just use it as an excuse to put up what I regard as one of the greatest declarations of obedience from the other three when they were about to go into the fiery furnace for not worshipping an image of gold on this occasion. Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego replied to him. This is in Daniel chapter 3. King Nebuchadnezzar, 
We do not need to defend ourselves before you in this manner. That's a real confident start, folks. They're at peace with what they're about to do. They've made up their minds where they're going. They, they just say, we don't need to defend ourselves. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we are able to... We are, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. That's a pretty confident assertion. They're saying he, he can do it and he will do it. But then they say something that normally we wouldn't include in the name it and claim it faith school. They say, but even if he doesn't, we want you to know your majesty that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you've set up. Let me, let me give you a mini interpretation. Our obedience to you, Jesus, is not based on whether we get rescued or not from this situation. You hearing me, church? Because even if we don't, we're not, we've made up our mind. So we don't say, oh, well, yeah, sure, Jesus, because you're going to bail us out every time. That's not always the case. Sometimes we do pay a price, we do suffer, we do experience cost and sometimes as our brothers and sisters in Sri Lanka have experienced, it's at the cost of our life for worshipping Jesus. But these guys are saying, our God can deliver us, we can be rescued, we're so confident in him and his goodness, we don't even need to defend ourselves but even if it doesn't happen, we ain't for that way of life. And folks, I want to encourage you with that this morning. I really want you to think on this. I want you to settle some things in your heart this morning about your way and the way that you are living so that you know that if this situation comes to you, and it does in more subtle ways, that you are fixed in this. Jesus said in Revelation chapter 2, Do not be afraid of what you are about to suffer. I tell you, the devil will put some of you in prison to test you, and you will suffer persecution for 10 days. Be faithful even to the point of death, and I will give you life as your victor's crown. Jesus is saying, whatever you go through, be faithful. Ultimately, you will be in my presence. You experience life with me as you've never known it before. Remain faithful. So what happens to Daniel? Chapter 6, 19 to 23. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice. Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den, and when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. And folks, it's that final phrase that we are now going to spend some time reflecting on and by God's grace and the power of your Holy Spirit, I want it to go in deep with each of you here today. Because there are some of you who say, Pastor, I understand, I trust God, I feel very confident in this matter, thank you for reaffirming it, no problems. There are others of you who have been following Jesus for a long time, but maybe you're struggling to remember or understand what it means to trust God. Maybe you're not, you know, making decisions that require that trust. Maybe you're not standing against the flow, you're going a little bit with it. And trusting God is no longer necessary. Faith has become irrelevant to the life you're living. And you're wondering about where you sit in relation to trust. I'm praying for you today to have a revival of trust in God. To have an absolute renewal of trust in God in your heart right now. And then there are others of you who would say, I am never conscious ever in my life of trusting God. I wouldn't call myself a Christian. I, I don't follow Jesus. 
what do I do with this? I'm saying to you for the first time, place your trust in God. Because when you say yes to Jesus, you're saying yes to trusting him for salvation. You're saying, Lord, deliver me. Save me, not only from my sin, but in all situations in my life, I'm now placing my trust in you. I'm following after you. I'm resting in you. Wherever you sit today, you need to leave this place having locked away in your heart that you are a person who trusts God. You hear me? I don't want anyone to walk out and think, oh, I'm not sure about that. Proverbs chapter 3 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. When we don't trust in God, we are starting to make the decisions ourselves. We're trying to work things out ourselves. We're trying our own solutions. It's a little bit of this and it's a little bit of that. We can't remember which is up and what's down. We've lost our compass. We're not sure which direction we're going in. We're trying to sort things out because we are not trusting in God with all our heart. And we need to be in that place. Isaiah 25 says, In the day, in that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Is that a place where you would like to stand today? Is that a place where you will be standing in the future? When you look at Jesus and say, surely this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. And finally, in Romans 15, we read, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace when, as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. I want to leave this up for a minute. I want to ask you a question. Would you like to overflow with hope? I mean, how much hope do you want this morning, folks? None? I'd rather be depressed and distraught and completely hopeless in my life. I mean, I don't know. Maybe you're feeling that way. You just, there's, maybe there's no hope. You don't want any hope. I don't know. Do you want just a little bit of hope? Just enough, Pastor, just enough hope that there'll be lunch on today that I can get out there and have a coffee soon if you're going to wrap it up. Just give me a little bit of hope. How long is this going to go on for? Golly gee, help me out. How much hope do you want? Or do you say, Pastor, I felt hope. I feel hope. I want to overflow with hope. I want peace. I want joy. And I want to trust in the Lord Jesus. I want to say yes to Jesus. I want, I, I want him to save me. I want him to rescue me. I want him to deliver me. I, I want to be found trusting in him. I want my hope to overflow. Because friends, in life, hope makes all the difference. Hebrews chapter 10 says to you, and I'm, this is a, a, a verse for folks who've said yes, and then we're going to have a, a, a verse for folks who haven't said yes yet. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching, that being the second coming of Christ. He who promised is faithful. Are you glad about that, church? We say it together again. Jesus is faithful to his promises. And he's one of them. And this is the last scripture we're going to end on before we have a time of ministry this morning. Romans 10, verse 9. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Friends, I read it in the Bible. 
If I confess with my mouth Jesus is Lord and I believe in my heart that he is who he said he is and God raised him from the dead, I will be saved. Do you believe that this morning? Have you made that confession? Is it your time this morning? Let's close our eyes and bow our heads and pray. Our Lord Jesus, we thank you so much firstly for the example of Daniel and his friends who stood up against the flow when it would have been very easy, even in the eyes of man, justifiable to preserve their lives and and do something different. But instead they placed their faith and their trust in you. And Lord, I thank you that you delivered them But I thank you also that they were prepared to give their lives if that's what it meant to trust you on that occasion. And Lord, we know that you, that you had to give your life as you trusted in your heavenly Father. Because your death meant life for every single person here who says yes to you. Your death means freedom from sin, the bad things we have done and the bad things that have been done to us, freedom for our inclination to go our own way. Instead, we are released to follow you in hope and joy and peace. And Lord, I thank you for being willing to make that sacrifice. And we pray this morning that you would help us to make the same sacrifice each day, Lord, as we follow after you. As every head is bowed, as every eye is closed in this place, every eye closed, I want to just make a moment for anyone here today who has not yet said yes to Jesus for the first time, who hasn't trusted in him for the first time, If that's you and you want to do that this morning, I'm offering you the opportunity to indicate that willingness and that desire by just raising your hand and saying, Pastor, I want to do that. I want you to pray for me and I want this day to be my first day of trusting God and saying yes to Jesus. Just while we've got a minute, while every eye is closed, if that's you, just shoot your hand up in the air so I can see it and then we're going to pray. If you want to make that commitment, if you, want to, if you want to say that, thank you, I see that hand, thank you very much, you can put that down. If that's you, if you want to put your hand up and say, that's me, I want you to include me in that prayer. Just a few more moments and then we're going to pray. Thank you, Jesus. All right, church. There's a person in here that's going to be praying this prayer for the first time. And I really want to join that person and I want all of us to pray out loud with that person this morning. Are you ready to do that? We're going to pray. Pray after me in this way. Lord Jesus, today I place my trust in your hands. Today I commit my future present and past to you. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for giving me hope. I declare that I will be faithful as you give me strength. In your name I pray, amen.